You know, it's always strange to me, no matter um, how many times I've come up behind the pulpit to share God's Word and to preach, um, I always get a little butterfly, a little nervousness, and you'd think that would disappear after time, um, but especially after being away for a couple weeks, uh, we had a really good vacation, and this week I found those those nerves like a little more intense and... Um, but I wanted to say just a couple things. Thank you. Uh, you guys are very generous uh, to me, uh, giving my family some time off, and uh, we just really valued that time. I'd like to say time away, but it was really time at home. But uh, it was working out some projects and just kind of connecting as a family. So uh, thank you for that. And hopefully uh, you got to appreciate uh, a different voice sharing God's word with you. And I think sometimes that's really healthy. Uh, one of the detriments of being kind of the only pastoral staff at FCCB, for better or for worse, it's my voice you hear almost every week. Um, and so to bring other gentlemen in to share God's word with you uh, is a, a great privilege. So whether it was Terry or... Um, Josiah has become a good friend. He's the son of one of my best friends who passed away. Uh, Josiah sharing with you. Or last week, uh, Bruce and a little bit Holly up here having some fun uh, sharing discipleship with you. I hope that you're able uh, to hear other voices sharing a same message. That God is really good. And Jesus is the best. And uh, our elders have been talking a lot about discipleship recently. Um, and discipleship is this interesting concept to me because we tend to think of it in a classroom setting. So, all right, come down to class 202 and I'm going to disciple you. And uh, if you're like me, first reaction is, uh, no thanks. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds intimidating. I don't really like classroom settings. When I graduated seminary, I had that awesome moment of, Woo! No more! You know? Um, we have these images that come to mind, but I want to share a little different perspective on discipleship. Discipleship is nothing more than learning what it means to follow Jesus. And we have uh, some broad ideas about discipleship. Um, we're spending time together as elders, kind of learning and uh, co- coalescing around some of those ideas. But beyond the general themes, here's what I believe. Discipleship always is very specific. So I don't ask the question, how do I follow Jesus in a general sense? I just don't. Maybe you do, but I suspect your question is much more like mine. Oh no, I don't know what to do in this situation. Oh no, I'm so tempted at this moment. Man, that person with a name and a face is so hard for me. I I need help. I think it's in those specific moments of life that we ask the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus right now, right here in this moment? And I think that's one of the big tasks, if not the big task of the church, to make disciples teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. That means Monday at 10 o'clock as the new project comes into the office, man, what does it mean to follow Jesus here? It means on a Sunday morning as we gather to worship, what does it mean? What does it look like? How do I embrace? How do I walk? I think discipleship is always specific. What does it look like to love my wife unconditionally as Christ loved the church? Man, God, help me. How do I care for my dying neighbor who doesn't know you? And it's the answer to those questions, really, is discipleship. And it happens in friendships. As we spend time together around a meal, talking and sharing, discipleship happens. As we point each other towards Jesus. It happens in counseling sessions, in specific ways, whether it's with me or someone else, coming and saying, I've got an issue, I need to work it out, and I need some help. 
discipleship, at the end of the day, um, images of, of hiking come into my mind. Um, I have not been out hiking yet this year. Uh, I read an article a couple weeks ago uh, that they rescued a guy on the east side of Mount Lafayette. So Route 93 and the Old Man on the Mountains, that's the west side of Mount Lafayette. Apparently, the other side, this fellow got lost, and it, it was maybe two weeks ago. The rescuers found him, which was great, but I was so struck with how they found him. They found him in chest-deep high snow, right? And so most people read that article like, oh, I'm thankful that they found the guy. And I had that moment of, oh, that's great. The rescuers found the guy. But my second one was jealousy, hiking in chest-high snow in mid-May. That's awesome. But you know what's not awesome about hiking? What's not awesome is just circling and going nowhere. Because there's a certain point, a walk in the woods becomes frustrating if you just do the same laps. It's why I hate treadmills. I hate them. Because you feel like a a mouse in a wheel and the thing's just going and you're exhausted but you haven't gone anywhere. You're just staring out the same window ten minutes later. True discipleship, following Jesus, it ought to move us. There ought to be an ascension. There ought to be a trail juncture that's different than what was behind me. There ought to be some sights that I'm seeing that begin to encourage me and say, man, that's beautiful. If I go a little higher up, I know it's going to get even better. It's why hiking works for me when I think about discipleship. The idea that that God expects us to move, to change, to grow. All right. Life. Life. Discipleship happens in life, uh, that real life that you live Uh, Sunday to Saturday, Monday to Sunday, however you want to divide your week up. Discipleship happens in that real life with the real challenges, the real emotions, the real experiences that you and I have. Following Jesus, uh, some discipleship is theological. And uh, we learn what God says about why did Jesus have to die. And so... There's an element of belief and truth that passes in. Uh, What did that accomplish for me? But I think more and more, following Jesus, being a disciple is simply in day-to-day activities. So the Gospel of Mark, my small group, has been uh, trudging through. I shouldn't even say that. It's actually been a real exciting journey. It just gets more and more challenging to connect as the weather gets warm outside. We've been traveling through the the book of Mark, and um, I'm amazed. Um, Tim shared something early, early on about the herald coming in, screaming out, gospel, gospel, which is how Mark starts. He says, there's some really good news. I'm writing this book to show you that Jesus is the Son of God. And so we see the story of Jesus at the end. Uh, he's crucified. He rises from the dead. The Holy Spirit comes. In later books, Paul is converted. The churches are planted. The Gentiles are saved. The explosion of Christianity, Jesus followers, is happening. And yet, the Bible doesn't end there. It's interesting to me. All the letters that are written after the book of Acts are written about appointing pastors and elders and creating communities to create disciples, to teach people how to live and how to be like the teacher. Half the New Testament is not about the events of Jesus, but rather answering the questions that you and I have. Man, what does following Jesus look like here? How do I do this thing? 
How should I be thinking and believing and treating my neighbors? How should I be worshiping? And what should I think about work and the environment? And all of it is packed into letters, mainly that Paul wrote to others saying, let me disciple you. Let me teach you. Let me share with you. So for the next few weeks anyway, we're going to unpack some areas within which I think some of these common struggles all lie. It's probably not comprehensive, but best I got. So we're ready to show our six. These are the six topics that I think most struggles can fit in. The first one that we'll hit today is anger. Anger. Uh, we'll have a chance to talk a lot about this. So uh, number two is guilt and regret. You have that one? Uh, number three is related to guilt and regret. Shame. Uh, number four, we're going to look at suffering. This is like loss and being a victim and perennial sickness. And how do I deal with those difficult things in life? And, and number five, man, what a big one, fear. How much of our struggles go under the umbrella of fear? I'm afraid that this, I'm not sure, and so I'm holding back. Fear is a big one. And then I made up a word for number six. Yesing. I don't know if that will ever catch on, but it should, right? We all know what it means, yesing, saying yes when we should say no. Part of that is calendar stuff. But man, a lot of that is, there's a lot of things in this world that I ought to be saying no to. That I find myself saying yes to. This is where addictions fall under. um, Habits that we form. Choices that we make. So, these are the six that I think many, if not all of our struggles, drop into one of these areas. So, this morning, anger. Alright, can we uh, hit the next one? Um, this is either, I know it's coming. There it is. All right, so I thought about this one. This picture is either a portrait of some of you, just a little snapshot that I put up here, or it's a selfie. It's a little selfie I took of me in times of anger. I don't know if there's anyone that doesn't at some point face the struggle of anger. I had an interesting story this week. Remember that uh, big thunderstorm that rolled through midweek sometime? It was like Wednesday or Thursday. Um, big flashes of lightning followed by this hammering thunder. Typically, if I'm asleep, I can sleep through a lot of that. But this night, we weren't asleep because our dog, who's little and yippy, he really doesn't like thunderstorms, okay? And a part of our vacation time was we rearranged all the bedrooms and did some work, and so Esther and I ended up on the first floor, which is very easily accessible for Paco. So the thunderstorm comes, and all night, he's by the door, whimpering and scratching the door and jingling his little jingles. And so, I don't know what time it was, three in the morning, two in the morning, we tried to ignore it, and and now I can't anymore, and it's driving me crazy. The worst thing about not being able to sleep is you get absolutely focused on not being able to sleep. And so it just like feeds itself. And so finally, I threw the the covers off. I'm like, I've had it. I'm done. I'm just going to go do some work. So I throw Paco out into the storm thinking maybe he has to pee. (laughs) And uh, bring him back in. Poor guy soaking wet. So here's my tender moment. I took one of our old hair dryers and dried the dog at three in the morning. And um, and then I sit down and I'm worked up. Like, I'm not happy that I'm awake at three in the morning. 
And I sit down, open my laptop to do some work, and I think, oh, all right, I'll just work on the sermon a little bit here. And the topic hits me again, anger. What a moment for me at three in the morning to deal with my own heart and what I'm working through. I mean, anger is a big bucket. Here's an article this week, uh, a news story that probably most of us heard about, about a Montana politician and a reporter. Um, if you didn't get exposed, one of the politicians running for House of Representatives seems like uh, tackled a reporter, somehow physically assaulted him. And so that becomes a story. It, and here's what one of his supporters said. This is a comment in one of the articles. If you have somebody sticking a phone in your face, a mic in your face, over and over, and you don't know how to deal with the situation, you haven't really done that, you haven't dealt with that, I can see where it can dot, 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 make you a little angry, he said Thursday. Meaning, if I get annoyed enough, of course, anger is an appropriate response. Just last weekend... We were down in Nashua. Um, I coached the Sienna soccer team. I've been around enough coaches and enough parents to understand this idea of anger and how it interacts on a soccer field with eight-year-olds. And I saw one of the craziest things. Because I've seen enough and I've interacted enough, oftentimes I'll try to preempt it. I have quite a bit of self-control as a coach because I have layers of self-control as a parent, as a coach, as a follower of Jesus. So I'm decent, for sure. And so we were down in Nashua, where I grew up. I know that culture down there pretty well. And uh, went up to the coach before the game. We talked, and he said something about how young the referee was. And it was my trigger. I knew where that was going. And so I said, It's a good thing, right, coach, that we get to exercise self-control. And so even if the young referee makes a bad call, we don't have to yell at him. And I'm thankful for that. And that that was me trying to say, please don't. These are little kids. Five minutes into the game, he picks up his bench, holds it, puts it back down. He's not done. He grabs a soccer ball, squeezes it as hard as he can, marches down the sideline to the corner to try to vent some of his anger and some call for little seven-year-old girls. And then he marches back, releases the soccer ball, puts it down. He did the soccer ball technique probably three times that game. And here's what I wondered. What would it be like to live with that man? Because anger doesn't come up in a specific situation. Anger is an underlying thing that circumstances release often. And I will guarantee you, if you cut that guy off on the road, there's going to be some finger motions to you, if not something more. I guarantee you, if you're one of his kids and you cross that guy, you are going to get a boatload of anger because that's how it works. It's not just, oh, that one time I'm angry. It tends to be, I deal with anger and it's showing up here and here and here and here. Anger's a pretty big bucket, and examples abound. And here's what I think is true. Nearly every example of anger in our lives does not lead to vibrant, life-giving results, but rather anger tends to put you in a pretty precarious place. Can we put up 2 Corinthians this is a overarching goal that the apostles put out for us on, all right, what does it mean to be a disciple? Here's one way we can summarize it. So we make it our goal to please him, meaning pleasing the Lord, pleasing God, pleasing Jesus. We make it our goal to please him. I interpret that when I'm out on the soccer field, I have an overarching goal. Man, God, how do I please you out here? 
when I'm driving down the road and someone cuts me off, I have an overarching goal. How do I please the Lord in this situation? In my marriage, as a father, as a pastor, as a neighbor, as a coach, as a man, in any situation, there's this overarching umbrella over me. God, how do I please you in this specific situation? It's not earning God's favor, and I want you to hear this. It's not about earning God's favor but rather learning how to respond to his love and his kindness. Because your father is really generous. He's a very generous giver. He's given us the very best he had so that we could live with him and follow him and be his children. And as we receive a generous gift, have you ever had that in your life? Someone treats you amazing, treats you like you don't deserve, Gives you a gift that you didn't expect. If you've ever experienced that generosity, maybe it's in your marriage, and you blew it, and you know you blew it, and you deserve some retribution, and you deserve some harshness or some silent treatment or the couch, and you just kind of know it, but instead, your spouse chooses to react with grace and forgiveness. And says, yeah, that hurt. But I will never stop loving you, and I forgive you. If you've ever had that experience, how do you respond to that? Don't you go out of your way to try to find ways to please that woman or please that man? Because it's a natural response. When someone is generous to us, we don't try to earn that favor. We respond to it. And I think it's the same way with our Heavenly Father. We seek to please the Lord, not to earn His favor, but man, has He been good to us. And so we make it our goal. Oh God, how can I respond to you and how can I please you in every situation? And if that's the case, if we make it our goal to please Him, we need to ask with anger like all the others, Is anger sinful? Is anger opposed to God? Is anger displeasing to God? And if we answer that question, yes, then we work out our salvation through sanctification and prayer and spiritual disciplines and community. And here's a lie that many of you have chosen to believe. You say things like, that's just the way, and you can finish it, right? I am. Meaning, God can't do anything about that. That's a lie that many of us believe, and we say it, I think, for one reason. We don't want to stop being angry. We like it. And we may never verbalize that to another, but when we say, I'm... I'm just have fits of anger. That's just who I am. We say it before the throne of grace to God who says, there is nothing impossible for me. The the idea that we can't change is nothing less than a lie, an excuse that we use so we don't have to change. Classic example for me, um, So I don't know if there's any bigger pressure on a Sunday morning than the AV team. So this morning we saw it, right? It it was kind of hard to keep up. And I don't know how many of you kind of glanced back to the AV when that happened, like, hey, what's going on here? It just so happens that AV is my example this morning. I have never learned how to run the AV for one specific purpose. Why do you think I've never learned how to run the AV? So that I will never have to run the AV. Because I, I don't really want that pressure. I don't really want people asking me and other times to run it. And so the way I do it is, I don't know how. So therefore, I don't have to. Very much like many of us say, uh, it's just the way I am. 
I don't know how to change. So therefore, I don't have to, and I'll just keep on living with anger. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And all of us, those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, who have received his forgiveness, if we can put 2 Corinthians up, and all of us have had that veil removed, so that we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of God. And I love this. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him and reflect His glory even more. That's like this classic, I'm going up the mountain. Like it's hard sometimes, but I'm getting closer to God. I'm not stopping where I am. I'm changing. God is changing me. I'm in the process of being discipled and being sanctified and I'm not staying the same because the Spirit of the Lord is moving me from glory to glory. There's new things for me. There's new things. So the question, is anger a sin? Maybe one way we can answer that is, did God get angry? (laughs) Yes. Yes, He did. God got very angry many times. Uh, Reading through the Bible this year, I'm in 2 Chronicles. I have been shocked, quite truthfully, once again, on how angry God actually gets. And so, if God gets angry, anger itself cannot be a sin, right? I think we would all say, all right, That makes sense. If God gets angry, anger in and of itself isn't sinful. In fact, righteous anger can be good. Because it motivates us to channel it for good and justice and to set wrong things right, which is what Jesus' life was. He was passionate for God's way and he was passionate for the kingdom. And Jesus was angry when the religious leaders stood in the way of it. And Jesus channeled that righteous anger, that emotion, not at retribution, but in humility to serve and to give the very hardest thing he ever could give. Righteous anger can be good, but let's be honest. Righteous anger is not typically what fires me up. Nor is it typically what gets you all worked up. Rather, it's Anger experiences like yelling at your spouse, stewing silently in your cubicle over something someone said, the coach storming down the sidelines, maybe uh, giving your finger some exercises as you drive. These, within the church, are typically what we see when we see anger. It's not a righteous anger. It's not a righteous anger on, oh God, I've neglected the poor, our society. We don't release uh, freedom for the prisoners. God, we, we abandon the aliens who come in desperate need. God, it makes me so angry. I want to move in justice. I don't know if I've ever had that conversation with anyone. Rather... I have these conversations. I cannot believe I work hard so day to er, so so hard every day to earn the paycheck only to come home to a dirty house. I'm so angry. I've had that one quite a few times. I've had this conversation quite a few times. I can't tell you how angry I am that the elders didn't listen to my opinion. I've had that conversation quite a few times. Because our anger doesn't often rise out of a righteous anger. But here's how our anger comes about. Our anger typically comes about there's something we want, a clean house to be listened to, or our opinions to actually be enacted on, or some other to have safe driving experiences out there with pleasant drivers around you. We have something we want that gets interrupted, that gets blocked. Now we can't get it, and our reaction then 
is anger. Typically, that's how our anger comes about. There's three words that are used. Ephesians chapter 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. I think the reason God gives us that is the longer we hold on to that anger moment, the more it will utterly destroy you. And what has happened is if we've held on to that anger You've given your enemy, the one who hates you, the deceiver and the liar, you've given the devil a foothold to influence your life. And if I stay angry long enough, my opinion of whoever I'm angry at will utterly change. If I stay angry long enough, I will not unconditionally love my wife anymore. If I stay angry long enough, my co-worker is not someone there that's been sovereignly placed by the Lord that he might reach out and find God in me. He is now my enemy. Which would be a delight to the devil for us to view others that way. Anger is simply an emotion in a moment. And we're cautioned in that moment, don't let it drive you to do something sinful. Don't let the sun go down. Don't give the devil a foothold because there's a certain path anger leads us on. You know, you're going to recognize this path. This is Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Paul writes to his friends, discipling and teaching them. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now, you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. And I think Paul is literally giving us the footpath. Where does anger take us? It looks like this. Anger, which turns to rage, which turns to malice, which comes out as slander, and eventually it's just filthy language coming off your lips. Here's the three words he uses for anger, rage, malice. The first one is, in Greek, it's orge, it's anger. This is one God is attributed having often. This is the word in Greek when we see God or Christ being angry. It's this one, it's orge. It's the reaction deep inside that something is fundamentally wrong and you don't like it. It's a foundation, an internal building block, an indignation or an agitation of the soul. This is where it begins. And on that, this is not unholy. If I see a young man take a purse from an older woman down the street, what's one of my reactions? I would hope it's anger. I can't believe he just did that. And in that anger, to fuel me to come in to rescue or be a part of or make that wrong thing right. In and of itself, this one, it just is. This is potentially a good reaction. But here's where it leads. Anger eventually leads to wrath, which is the word thumos. Sounds like an explosion just even saying that word. Because ultimately, that's what it is. It's the external leakage of orge. And for some of you, it's volcanic. It literally erupts. So you have that moment, you've been wronged, or something has stood in your way, you get angry. But you don't heed the caution in our anger to not sin. Rather, you take the step that anger is leading you to, and it's volcanic, and you erupt And your anger would be wrath. It's loud. It's scary. And it's intended to be scary. Because you want to force your way as much as you can. 
And if my anger can get me what I want, I'll use it. Thumos is the external leakage of orge. And for others, it's not so much volcanic, but for others it dives deep to shut someone else out of life. And so I may not have the explosive words or those threatening kind of moments, but I will absolutely go thumos by shutting down, shut you out, shut you out, and not let you anywhere near me. Because that's my way of playing revenge, of being volcanic. Last word, anger. Anger can lead to wrath and then ultimately malice. This word is kakia. It's evil, wickedness, hatefulness. This one is the middle finger out the window. This malice is leaving the dishes undone to teach her a lesson. Or, as Jesus taught, this is the mental formulation to get even. For what happens in our mind, Jesus says, is the same as what we do in God's eyes. Where malice, you can't pray for someone's blessing. Malice says you pray for revenge. You want to get even. You want to make this whole equation right. So James offers this advice. And I think he, too, is thinking about this train that eventually takes us to slander and filthy languages where our tongues cut each other, where we cause suspicion of others and we try to malign the reputation of others out of our anger and out of our wrath and out of our malice. James chapter 1 says this, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Who should be quick to listen? Even uh, people who are 50 and set in their ways. Even people who have that volcanic eruption tendency. Everyone, it's not just the pastor should be quick to listen. It's not just those who are held respectfully and who tend to have some self-control. James makes it really clear, guys. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager or if you're retired or if you're a man or a woman or a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter. It doesn't matter. James tells us everyone should have this if you're following Jesus. Part of ascending that mountain is learning to be quick to listen. So instead of flying off the handle, maybe you should find out what's really going on in the heart. Instead of responding as if you're the victim and you've been uh, oppressed and someone has taken something away, to be quick to listen, to hear why. To hear the thoughts, the heart of another. Which is really hard to do when you're angry. That's why it's a spirit thing and not a man thing. Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And I think for many of us in the heat of anger, we may say, well, it may not bring about the righteous life that God desires, but it sure may give me what I desire. And we're on the precipice at that point. What matters most to us? Is it to learn to please God, even in moments of anger? Or is it to play it out all the way down that trail so that I'll get what I want using anger? What a scary precipice to be on. Will I choose to please God and be quick to listen and slow to anger and exercise self-control or will I go for what my heart wants? How do we handle anger? Do we notice it? How do we live so as to be slow to become anger? Does God offer a way to escape or de-escalate anger? Here's what I'm going to leave you with. We'll 
kind of get more specific next week in what, what we do. But here's uh, my take-home homework for you. Okay? Here it is. Be very, very hesitant this week to defend your anger. Be very, very hesitant to offer defense for the reasons you're angry. Because it is most likely not righteous anger. It's most likely selfish anger. And this week, ask the Holy Spirit to convict you when you lack the ability to notice it. Angry people tend not to notice that they're angry people. And it takes someone else with the courage, because it's hard to face an angry person, to identify the anger in someone's life. And if it's hard for you to see anger in your life, ask the Holy Spirit this week, in humility, to convict you when you don't notice it. And this is what we'll explore more next week. When you get angry this week, it doesn't matter what the scenario is, okay? When you get angry this week, pause And just ask yourself this one question. Because I think this is where Jesus takes us. What would humility look like right now? And I think if we can take that take-home assignment, be aware and alert, and when it rises, ask yourself that one question. What does humility look like in this situation? And then next week we'll explore a little deeper on the path that God sets out for us. We seek to please the Lord in all we do, even in things that may seem uncontrollable, like anger. You know, we carry some good news, guys. You are not alone. You're not alone on this trail. You're not left without a Sherpa to guide you up the mountain. God has given you the Holy Spirit to walk with you if you have the humility to listen and obey. Let me pray and uh, invite our worship team up. By the way, the sermon was not timed to kind of correlate with our annual meeting season. (laughs) But if God sovereignly has it, let it be so. God, thank you for your good life-giving words to us. God, we need your help to love others enough and to see your image in them. To be quick to listen and slow to tear down in anger. God, I pray that you would guard our hearts and our minds this week. That we could be good ambassadors of Jesus in the moments that you give us rather and giving the devil a foothold. God, may you guard our words. May you make us sensitive to the movements of your spirit. And God, may you fire the passion in me. And may you fire the passion in all of us that we would make it our goal to respond to your awesomeness and your grace and your love and your mercy by pleasing you in all that we do. God, thank you for your good gifts to us. In Jesus' name, amen.